Really, how did you come to make this film? Well, um, I guess uh, most of the films I've been doing, they've been in just uh, in the, uh, what I call, many ovens at a different degree, you have different scripts. This is a script I developed here in the United States initially. I changed it because it didn't, you know, because of the co-production relationship with the Europeans that I had. Otherwise, I really wrote it for the U.S. And then uh, it just um, would be so difficult to produce it here. So I did it in German <coughs> and, well, in co-production with German shot in Ethiopia and Germany. But it's, a, you know, it's more, it's, it's really about, the, I have always wanted to really express about the generation I belong to. And um, uh, I'm still unfulfilled, but this is a, a, just a, an imperfect attempt to really tackle that generation. If I, if my math is correct, you left Ethiopia as in your youth 43 years ago. Yeah, something like that. So. I mean, one of the things that for me was really palatable it was the the pain of 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 that separation and and the, the pain of, of in a sense ha having to find a different identity in a different life. Mm -hmm. and, and, you, and usually because I think um, from because of the kind of historical and kind of conditions we come from. Uh, our pain is postponed. Personal pain, personal uh, love, even personal interest is postponed for country, for need of the people. You know, when you come from like those folks you saw in the film, are the peasants are all my uncle, the old man, you know, who was under the trees, uh, with, you know, talking to the gorilla leader, uh, is my uncle, and these are the people that I have to go and visit, and then unable to respond to their need. Especially in my case, I studied film. Uh, my wanting to study even theater or film was not, you know, when, in fact, within UCLA, uh, I was always ashamed to tell people I was studying film because as an Ethiopian, I should study agriculture, economics, sensible things. Even my, my family there now do not know I studied film, so they always called me, Are you high? You know, when I'm had a khaki madrilehavendin. Which means if you've gone abroad, you should be a doctor. <laughs> and uh, so it's really, in fact, also Tashoma, I'm sorry I have to bring Tashoma in because it's his occasion. I remember how he used to miss his mother. And the first dialogue that I have there um, <clears throat> about his mother, <clears throat> I will not die until I see my mother, kind of, it's, I'm borrowed, I borrowed a lot of this generational alienation and displacement, unable to go back, unable to stay. Most, most uh, Africans, in my view, and a lot of foreigners, especially the first ones who uh, <clears throat> take, cross the ocean, <clears throat> their stories are untold. They don't have the power to tell it, they don't have the finance, they're not published. Our individual stories drowns in the collective need. And so there's a lot of pressures that does not permit to exercise our individual story. And this film is really not, uh, you know, I, 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 have, I have personal experiences. Some of the nightmares are mine, the dreams are mine, but also I share with a lot of my generation and how they felt displaced, unable to go, unable to come. Even, for example, in the scene where you saw the two guys after he vo forced to vomit, his, uh, his, you know, after he forced the vomit, if you hear an airplane, uh, now, an airplane in America is just a normal soundtrack. Uh, in the Ethiopia that I know, including myself, I'll go missing my home, and then when I hear the plane, sometimes I want to be on that plane. And so even that soundtrack is about disappearing, sometimes unable to respond to the needs of your poor people, or poverty is so confrontational, it's so, you know, also neglected by middle-class Ethiopians that you just don't want to go, you don't want to live, and then you, you run away, and then you go back. So there's this schizophrenic, especially about African intellectuals that never been you know, allowed to be made into a movie. I tried in this film to do that. And so in many ways, it's about a generation that is so displaced. 
as was brought to America, for example, the United States, uh, meaning like, you know, most people do not know uh, during the Kennedy, from Eisenhower started, but Kennedy especially, to combat their uh, competition with the Soviet Union, they have to develop an elite. And Haile Selassie, in his idea of modernization, wants to also develop an elite. But this elite uh, fabrication uh, sometimes tramples over human needs and human relationships. And love and relationships are trampled over for the higher need. And so I've always felt, how do you make a film about that? And this is just an, ex an, you know, an imperfect attempt to do that. It's, it seems also to be a film about the failure of ideology. And, and in particular, you know, the, the left, which in, in, you know, whether in the 20s and 30s or in the 60s and 70s, there's, there's an incredible optimism, and then the revolution ends up eating its children. Uh, again, to show, uh, to show one, I don't know if we got a book or something, there was one time uh, this whole turmoil brought an idea of like Marxism with human face because this whole interest in the peasant and the working class lacked a human face. So when you go into this dogmatic binge, you trampled over so many things, including your own personal uh, humanity. Are there any questions out in the audience? Uh, Wait, there's a microphone coming. Hello. Yes. Um, first of all, I want to thank you for this powerful film. I, I have two questions. Uh, one, I notice a lot of the emphasis on Ethiopian culture. So my first question is, how important is culture in your films? And then secondly, you talked about the black power movement. What are some of the people or concepts that influence you in terms of your thought? Well, I think not only me, a lot of filmmakers, I think are, I think Fanon is a very critical uh, intellectual, um, landscape. I think uh, today it is not, is not really exhausted, studied, but I think Franz Fanon is, comes to mind. Uh, but I also think, I think in terms of the, the African American movement, you know, has a, a big impact on the, the generation that came in my time. And that brings Malcolm X, for example, and it's because of your own alienation, you, ident you identified that alienation being amplified by that uh, political struggle. Um, but there's also a lot of, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's too, I have to think about it, but uh, a lot of, uh, I would say, um, you know, I'll, I'll come back to it when I get my stuff more, but in the first part, in terms of culture, I think it, 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 the first thing colonialism hit in Africa is the culture. When you hit the culture, it means you hit the foundation, and after that you have an enslaved population. I think especially in the Ethiopian case, uh, we do not, for us, culture is an earring, a piece of thing we show to people in tourism, in posters. But it's, and we take mileage, the contemporary Ethiopians, we take We've, we've benefited from the culture of the barefoot Ethiopians who built an amazing foundation for us. We still live on the benzene of uh, that period. In, in, in the Ethiopian elite in this modern context, um, from the time of especially uh, the 1930s, Ethiopians cannot account a single statue that they made with their own hands. We still live off of the barefoot Ethiopians' history. And so it's a very common thing all over Africa that the African elite has been fabricated to be dysfunctional on the cultural level. And therefore, none of what we do works. Politically, our airports, our economics, nothing could work without the cultural foundations because there's the people of our system. Thank you. 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 But, you know, um, and so to me, that is why I'm in, in culture. I think the music, uh, 
I think the, the language, the Amharic, I wish, you know, you don't know how much English is so primitive, even if it is the most imperial language. It's so primitive. When he was asked, uh, an example, uh, he was, uh, the, 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 the minister said to him, Watat, Watat means swallow it. Okay, in Amharic, it is terror. In English, it is just, you know, criticism, retract. But retract doesn't go to the, so the Amharic language is so sophisticatedly hard to decode. Only people who try to subtitle Amharic, <laughs> translate Amharic could tell you. It's so a difficult language to translate. And so we approximate it. And so what is this people who, who invented such a language, had the writing in three, four types, and then had a whole lot of uh, cultural, spiritual uh, uh, structure they left. And uh, what is our historic responsibility to, to be in that shoulder and go? And so it is a fundamental in African problem. It's not only Ethiopian. We Africans just do not know that uh, the whatever we achieve in it doesn't go anywhere without the cultural base, because in the culture is the spirit of a people also. It's not just a simple brick they left, it's the spirit of their footprint they left. And often, being educated wants you to dwarf and look down upon your very foundation. Especially in my generation, one of our biggest psychological trauma was that we became ashamed of the backwardness of Ethiopia judging it by the lens of Eurocentric education. And therefore, we displaced ourselves. All our good, good intentions just completely backfired. Because we didn't even have, I met one guy who was a, a very, very dominant socialist in that forest. And I met him at the university, he said to me, Haile, it's the first time when I went to the woods that I realized I didn't know Ethiopia. Yeah, the university he taught, he knew Ethiopia, he lectured on Ethiopia, everything. In English, in French, anything, in any language you want. But when he went to the peasants, and the way they, there's a thing we call, Toshoma wrote about wax and gold, for example. The wax and gold, seven now what we call it, Wistawera, all these things. We leave all that to study the, the European, because we worship that uh, So it's not even an equal exchange for knowledge to know the literature of Europe. It is really to disappear, we go transaction in Europe or America. And I think that is the, what's, what was always not worked out is Kennedy's program did create Kofi Annan and Obama, but really for Africa, the implication is disaster. Because we, we in, I'm including myself, I'm like a repentant country hater person, <laughs> you know, because I, I could not accept the, the poverty, the flies, because I, I have gone into a Sputnik that negates that and does not understand that. But that barefoot Ethiopian has a mystery chips in his system or her system that I'm unable to decode now, having gone through all the PhD degree like a military junta in the intellectual plane. <laughs> Right time for Hold on a second, we're going to give you a microphone. Uh, please. I'm also the same generation of you and Tishome, and I just want to first of all acknowledge not just you and Tishome, but all the Ethiopians who, because of that quote unquote Kennedy force diaspora and the highly Selassie effort to modernize Ethiopia in a Western capitalist sort of way, provided Africans in America, those of us who come to the Black Panther Party, from the movement in the United States to have the wonderful experience of learning about Ethiopia and about the most serious worldwide foreign student movement that was militant. And Ethiopian student unions and the Eritrean student unions were the most militant movements that we saw in the 60s and 70s that had a major impact upon the black power movement. And in terms of ideological bankruptcy, I disagree with that. I think it would make major lessons and what has occurred is that there's been a forward motion towards Pan-Africanism, towards the what is of African people. But if the number of Ethiopian students that came here, you at Howard, to show me for me at UCLA, in the third world film course, that blew my mind, because I never saw a third world film until I came to UCLA, that had a major impact upon my political actions, 
and many of us, I just want to salute, not just you, to show me, but that thousands of Ethiopian students, many of them were 50, 60, 70, are now dying. We made a major contribution to the inevitable liberation and unification of Africa. So we just want to bow down to you and to show me to all those Ethiopian brothers and sisters who made such a contribution in the diaspora, brothers in Europe, brothers in Canada, throughout the United States, at Howard, the UCLA's of the world. We just want to salute all of the brothers and sisters from Ethiopia for their contribution. How you doing, sir? How are you? Excellent. Um, two questions. One, how long did the movie take to make from beginning to end? And two, do you see improvement in the youth, meaning like uh, 20s, 30s, uh, Ethiopian, going through an American experience versus versus uh, the time that you're speaking of? Well, uh, it took nine years to find the money. <laughs> so I don't want to just say, it took me nine years, when I say Sankova it took me nine years. Uh, but this is my life, it took me nine, twenty, hundred years, I, I wait, I stick with it. <laughs> and so nine years just to find the money, to shoot the film in Ethiopia eight weeks. It's a miracle work we did. To push the, you know, the German six days, which knocked. We're efficient, thanks to you know, the friends I had here at UCLA, the Charlie Burnett's, the Billies, and the Van Paul Wills, and uh, we were, we, we did a good produce, we learned how to do with nothing. And uh, so I come from that school, and, you know, and uh, to date it's helping me like hell. I, when I produce, uh, uh, you know, I'm more, like, a lot of people are amazed how I do. There was not, my co-production partner, a German, was doing a film somewhere in Russia, and he was there. He only came one night and flew back the next day. In eight weeks, I was the one doing the whole thing because of UCLA's collective knowledge I took from my friends. Uh, in terms of like, you know, uh, I'll tell you, uh, I have, I make films, uh, I, I, I leave batons. I don't have, uh, to me, the Pan-African youth. I'm not as uh, optimistic as the young man here. I think he's a little bit need to be corrected uh, that he's, he's really younger. He's like dieting, he's di dying his hair. He, does, <laughs> he doesn't belong to our generation, especially to Tashoma's. Uh, Tashoma was, I think, maybe his teacher, but he was young when I was arguing with him about our dogmatic bent. And so uh, for me, I think I'll tell you something. The Pan-African generation, um, it is in our death we are only, everything we have done after Nukrumah and the Afri independence of Africa, we are only fertilizers for the future, Sputnik. And it comes from Fanon. Fa uh, every you see, there's my hope why I still make movie. I'm not encouraged by the Africans that walk the world now. I'm not. I'm not going to lie to you. Black people are counterproductive. They don't invest on their culture. I had to beg white people to make a film about his mama and my daddy. And so therefore, I'm a realistic person. Black people do not invest on their own culture beyond doing and being proud doing booty call. So that is where I rested. Next thing. Next thing. But I do have a big hope, and the hope comes from Fanon again. And that is, every generation has a responsibility, fulfill some, fulfill some, do not. And I think what I learned is that there will be a generation that will come. But you cannot predict it dogmatically. Dogmatism turns people off. It kills, it's like it kills the seed of hope. The whole thing is to do what you're supposed to do that moment you lived in this planet. Lift the stone, leave it. Don't force nobody, don't push nobody, don't think you know more than anybody. Because that killed many people. Many good people have died of being sacrificed. Mothers only were left to like, to, to grieve for them. And so what my hope is that, I don't know when, I'm not a fortune teller, but there is, there will be, because I did exist, there will be a multiplied generation that will come. But some, you know, some are ashes. My father, when I was growing up, I was, I was challenged in my community, how can you be you are the son of a fire and turned into ashes when I start going into the American colonial culture.
when I was into Elvis Presley and, and John Wayne, Tarzan, my Gondor parents just said, you are displaced and you are an ash. Your father is a fire. And now I'm going to, why I learned this Ashes and Embers is the movie I made because there is, in the ashes, there's fire burned. My mother always buried fire by ashes. She doesn't have this, uh, you know, yeah, matches and fire. We don't have, you know, you know, she has fire, but inside the ashes. In the morning, she scrapes the fire, I mean the ashes, and the fire pops up. This is a Cushitic civilization that came all the way from the Nile that's still around now. I think there will be a generation that will rise when you don't know. You, you don't have to like, force history to know because then you will turn fascist. But there will be people who will be against oppression, against dislocation, where black people could not tell their story, the real true story, not a story that per they are permitted to tell, but a story to exercise their own demon, their own toxic thing they carry because in colonial experiences, you equally come into the planet disfigured. You don't come pure out of South African experience. You come diseased. And therefore, what you do is you make movies, you do poetry, you do music to exorcise that toxic stuff you carry. You don't just come out clean into the planet. I will not have done a movie if I didn't believe they will come when I don't want to know, I don't have to force, just do my part. But there will be Africans, there will be Ethiopians, no nonsense Ethiopians, firebrands, the children of the dragon will come. Good evening, Mr. Gorilla. I, uh, last time I saw you was about 15 years ago when Sankofa was in Marina Del Rey. And I went to see it, and, and I heard you speak just like uh, you're speaking now. I love this film. Um, I knew when I heard about this film just a couple of days ago it was going to be a, a remarkable experience, just like Sankofa was when I saw it. What I really loved about the film that you talked about was my, my parents are, are Nigerian, from Nigeria, and I, uh, when I was about 14 years old, we moved to we left America and moved back to Nigeria. I'd never been to Nigeria before. And my parents moved back for the same reasons the guys in your movie moved back. They came here in the 60s, got their education, worked, saved some money, and wanted to go back and, and, uh, and change the country. And uh, got a rude awakening, very similar to what the gentleman got in the film. So I was, I totally, even though it was a different, it's Ethiopia and this Nigeria, very similar. My father was so uh, disillusioned after about two or three years, he wanted to move us back to the United States, but my mother, they fought about this, and, and my mother went out. We stayed, but you know. But I, I just was really marvelled at how you um, told that experience, which I have never seen before in any movie. Uh, but it's very real, you know. Coming out to get your education for a good purpose to go back, and then dealing with, you know, my parents were told, "Hey, you were enjoying America while we were here suffering and fighting in the Biafran War. Get in the back of the line." And you're not going to bring any of that white stuff you learned in America t to Nigeria. It was, I really watched my parents go through it, so I love that part of your film, and I think it's a, a wonderful film. I'm so glad I, I came tonight. I'm glad I canceled my plans and came tonight. Thank you. Thank you. I told Gurma. I'm a Saganalu for making this film. It's um, a little bit easier to read the books about Menelik and about Teodros, but about um, what you showed with respect to the, the wars that happened in the 80s and the 90s is a little bit more difficult to, to read those books. I'm sure that there's some filmmakers and students that, that are here in this audience can you share with them some insights and, and knowledge so that you know they can be great filmmakers and you can give them some tidbits of, of understanding so that they can make you know wonderful films like you and and I know financing is the issue but maybe you can share with them some some knowledge. That's a tough one. Um, 
You know, I just think people, uh, I think know yourself, know your tendencies, study yourself. Um, be critical, think a lot, you know, uh, care. Uh, most of, like, caring is a crime in, a, in, a, in now in corporate planet, but you, not give up in caring. It's not abnormal to care. Um, but also to know one's history, but to not be greedy and just study your own history, but the history of the planet is equally yours. But also do not lose you in the, in the soup of the planet. And so, uh, I, I, I don't know, to me, I think the young filmmakers uh, that I, um, I'm not, uh, you know, I'm, I may not have, uh, I'm, I'm not a good, good guy to invite to inspire young people. <laughs> uh, because I think they have, they have to be badgered and beat up like hell to make a, an inner struggle within their own generation. Because you and me could not make sense to young people. Young people can make sense to each other. And so the intergenerational fight should be now, uh, like when I did Ashes and Embers, I was working on, should, you know, a grandmother, should she uh, not impose her value on this renegade grandson? Or should she just uh, puppy him, you know? And I, I wanted her to challenge him because she lived and her entitlement is to chastise the young. That's how I grew up in Ethiopia. I was collectively chastised even by people who didn't even raise me. And all of it went to, to, to make me who I am now. And so I do not believe, you know, like, um, I think young people should not be allowed to be welfare uh, recipients of the struggle of the past. They had the good. They're geared, they have laptops, they have earrings, they have this, they have that. And there's no way I don't have a contradiction with them. Their privilege and my knowledge of where I have come is complete conflict. They are privileged and you have to let them know and die because I think they remember you. I think I remember my grandmother for chastising me and I, I always, although at the time I didn't hear her, I now close my eye to, to remember the things she said because it is my vitamin, it's my salvation, even in the faded sound of my grandmother. The look only of my father. My father briefly talked to me. He doesn't, you know, he just said, talk to me a few things in our planet since we existed. But volumes I have gotten from his silence of his disapproval of my lifestyle, of what I was doing, etc. And so, for me, I have a different orientation. I think the young people should be challenged. They're privileged, especially black people's children, cannot, cannot be responsible, having come yesterday from the conditions black people came. And so, uh, this hip-hop paternalistic, even the intellectuals glorifying even the fascist tendency of hip-hop and not taking them to task, I don't identify. I don't glory everything about hip hop. I think it should be investigated. Also, uh, in, in, in now, even in African American music, and forgive me for you know going into it without authority or if you say a degree in music, musicology, but let me tell you, African music has always been unseated by a music that came behind it. It's not always a, you know you don't reign forever. Some music movement is unseated by, it's an African culture. You unseat the kingdom of culture by the new one. Hip hop is the, the most longest expression, unchallenged, unbaited, even turning some of the professors to rappers themselves. Okay? What is it? It is a culture, is a culture that is connected to Sony powerful children with Sony, okay? They are powerful to conquer the world, misrepresenting even black humanity in some extent. Hey, I don't go for it. I would like to fight it. And I told <laughs> excuse me. I don't know if you know uh, Dead Press. 
I, I, they, they know me. At Cornell, we had it out. And they know me. And they're good people because they take where I'm coming. They understand where I'm coming from. And so for me, I don't think we should paternalize our children to a point to have become the betrayers of the footprint of resistance and struggle. Ah. One more question, right down here. Women, can you get some? Well, I don't want to get beat up when I come. I have a lot of friends. Carol, is, Carol is here. And yeah, I don't want to get beat up when I get out here. So, uh, my name is Perez Obino. I'm a Kenyan filmmaker. I've been in the United States for 15 years. And I just want to say that you have spoken to this generation. I don't know about anybody else who's sitting here. But when I sat here and the opening credits and the music started, that's my Africa, you know? Thank you. And when I sit and I'm, I'm on stage, I get on stage and I put on my African costumes and I did a play when I did it in my own native tongue and people walked up to me and said, why did you do it in that language? You couldn't understand it. And I said, my name is Perez Owen, I'm speaking your language. The least you can do is listen to mine. Thank you. <laughs> the dragons are there. We are few and far between, but we are here. Thank and you. We are fighting, and that's the reason why I am here. Thank you. Thank you. And I just want to add that there are those of us, the story you said is so great because there are those of us, Africa is in a place right now where not many of us can get on a plane and come here and get an education. And for me, being here, I have seen homeless children dying on the streets. I know why I am here. And I do not forget that Africa when I'm here. And so when somebody tells me to conform to something else, I say there's something greater that has brought me here. There's an entire continent, and I will not play small to make you comfortable with me. So I just want to let you know we are here. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much for honoring Ireland, Kalina, and Tishore Gabriel.